Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here at Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we've begun to have people from the congregation pray for the offering again. And I like that. I would encourage more of you to do that. I think we need more people up here, more people sharing, more people talking than just Mike and myself or even the worship team. And we've asked a few of you, and I hope you're willing to serve in that area or other areas. Some of you have chosen to read a poem during the prayer. Some of you have even sung a song. And we don't want to limit your self-expression. But for the rest of us, I don't know. Maybe you have never publicly prayed out loud. I mean, maybe you've prayed at the dinner table or you've prayed over your children as you've tucked them into bed. But if I said, hey, I think you'd be great at praying over the offering, some of you might think that was nerve wracking. <laughs> Public speaking is still the number one fear of Americans and that's over death. So I can just imagine how awkward or even terrifying it might be to be asked to publicly pray because you're worried. You're worried and you are thinking, ah, while I'm praying, I don't want everyone to be judging me, judging the words I say, judging whether my uh, prayer is too short or too long. I suppose the other worry would be, why ask me? What makes my prayer special? I mean, after all, I pray just like everybody else. I'm not any more fancy or any more eloquent than anyone else. Why, why would you choose me to pray out loud? Do we really think that? Do we think that our prayers are not special just because they sound like everybody else? I mean, it's possible. I mean, many of us do say standard phrases, right? So we say things that we've heard other people say. We have modular phrases when we pray. We just rotate them around depending on the circumstance, and we all know them. There are phrases like, our Father, or we begin with, dear Lord. Uh, we'll say, thank you for this day. We'll say, uh, give us traveling mercies. Or we'll say, throw a hedge of protection around us. Bless this food and the hands that have prepared it. And we always finish with, in Jesus' name. That's a prayer, right? I mean, that's what God wants from me, right? You can just mix and match a few of those and bam, throw in some prayer requests and you got yourself a prayer. And if there's ever a lull in the prayer, ever a pause, you can always throw out a few keywords. Uh, there's some prayer filler. One of them is the word just. You'll hear people say, Lord, if you'll just show up, we're asking that you'll just be with us. Another really good prayer filler word is Father. You'll hear people repeat it over and over. They'll say, uh, Father, we're just asking that you'd be with us, Father, and that you continue to walk with us, Father, and love those we've mentioned, Father. We can, we can laugh. We can laugh. But, but should we? Because prayer is one of the primary ways that we grow closer to God. And this is how we communicate with God. And, and he is the creator of the universe. So how should we be praying? If I told you that you had five minutes with Bill Gates, or that you had five minutes with Jeff Bezos, five min minutes with the, anyone rich or famous or powerful or influential or connected, wouldn't you want those five minutes to matter? You wouldn't just want to ramble off some memorized, prepared, shallow, meaningless statement. You know, just try to get to the end of the conversation quickly so you can check it off. No, I'd, I'd want my time to matter, that conversation to matter. So I should want my prayers to matter. So maybe I need to reset my prayer life, push the reset button on how I think about prayer. Jeremiah 33 says, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. You see, in prayer, we have this beautiful opportunity to meet with the creator of the universe. 
in that moment, I have his attention. So what am I going to say? How should I pray? That question was asked of Jesus once, but before he was asked, he taught his most famous prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. Did you know that? The Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew chapter 5, and by the time you get to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus begins speaking to people who actually want a renewed life, people who want to have the reset button pushed on their theology, people who are tired of commercialized and cookie-cutter religion, people who want an authentic relationship with God. Jesus is preaching to people who, even back then, wanted something different. They wanted a reset. And this is where we find the Lord's Prayer. But in fact, before he teaches the Lord's Prayer, Jesus offers some other instruction. Before he gives us the do this, first he starts with do not. He begins in verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So, really simply, Jesus offers us two little instructions about how not to pray. First, he says, don't show off, right? I mean, think about the synagogues were places of worship, places where people have gathered to pray. Jesus spoke against people who just stood and gave an oration loudly just so they could be seen and praised by other people. He called them hypocrites. Probably thinking of the Pharisees when he said it. They would often pray very loudly and they would beat their chests. Second, Jesus says, don't use a lot of meaningless words. The Gentile prayers were long because they would uh, try to attract their many gods. They repeated uh, a god's name over and over again, hoping to get his attention. Jesus said that that kind of prayer should be a private time between God and us. Now, Jesus doesn't mean that it's wrong to pray with other people or that other people can't hear your prayer. But again, like we talked about last week, we have to make sure that our heart is in the right place. We need to make sure that we're doing this from sincerity. And then following that, Jesus begins to teach us the Lord's Prayer. In verse 9, he says, Pray like this, Our Father. The Lord's Prayer begins with two words. Our Father. <clears throat> Why? Because this is the relationship. This is how we should be thinking of the relationship. When Jesus prayed, he called God Father. When Jesus spoke and taught about the kingdom of God, he used symbols and imagery that depicted God as a father. The story of the prodigal son, right? This illustrates it perfectly. Here we have two sons, and they had a good father, and they had not been pleasing. The younger son did not want to stay around and live under his father's roof. He wanted to take off. He wanted to live an independent life. The elder brother uh, wasn't pleased with his father either because he accepted the younger brother back unconditionally. And so as a result, God's children all through history, just like these two sons, they go to extreme lengths on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, one group depicts God as being a God that's all about justice and law and order and discipline. And critics might say, well, that makes God seem cold and uncaring. The other side would love to stress God's love and forgiveness and compassion and grace. And critics would say, well, that makes God out to be kind of wishy-washy. But the problem of trying to lock God down into one form of fatherhood is that our universe, our minds, cannot define God. They cannot contain God. We cannot put God in a box or create a God that meets our needs just for our own convenience. You know, a Sunday school teacher once asked her class of second graders if there was anything 
that God could not do. And one little girl sheepishly raised her hand and the Sunday school teacher called on her and said, yes, what is one thing that God cannot do? And the little girl said, he can't please everybody. It's true. But God's fatherhood is varied so that it can meet the needs of his varied children. God is father to both those who are legalistic and he is father to those who are free in love. Both the prodigal son and the elder brother. The father is not responsible for the weakness or the brokenness or the sin of either son. He didn't want his youngest son to go off and live for his own pleasures. He knew that that road would lead to failure. He knew that that road would lead to humiliation. But neither did he want his eldest son to be a legalistic snob. He would rather have his brother welcome the other brother back and forgive him just like he did. See, in this story, the father is not the problem. He was the center of the family. He is the only hope for this family's survival. The father is the one who tries to reconcile the relationship. So we start our prayer with our father because the father is God and he is the foundation of this family. He is the foundation of all of Christianity. He is the creator of the universe. And I know Christians will differ on a lot of things and they will argue about what they believe or probably even who God is. But the reality of fatherhood is the basis for Christian unity. And this is why the first word is father. And not just father, but our father, right? It's plural. It's not any father in heaven. It's our father. It's not the father I have. It's not my father. It's our father. It's not even the father that I have created in my own image. He's the father of all, the world's father, creation's father, our father. It's the same concept that we would say if we were saying our nation in the Pledge of Allegiance. The United States is one nation, but it's broken up into many different states. But it's still e pluribus unum, which means the many in one. This makes the Lord's Prayer a family prayer. Because if you read the entire prayer all the way through, there's not one mention of me or I. The whole prayer is plural. Our Father, give us our daily bread. Forgive us, lead us not into temptation. When Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray for everyone. He teaches us to pray for the family. Romans 8 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray, for as we ought. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. It's a prayer for us. James says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Listen to this poem. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and even once say I. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and even once say my. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and not include another. You cannot ask for daily bread and not include your brother. For others are included in each and every plea from the very beginning it never once says me. What do we pray next? What's the next part? Our Father in heaven. Yes, God is close. He is as close and as intimate and as loving as a father, but he is also removed. He is also different. He is also enthroned. He is also filled with glory. He is also other. He is something that we understand and he is something that we don't understand. Remember, we said that some Christians are legalistic and some are too casual. Well, Jesus addresses both of those audiences in the very first line. Our Father is personal, it's familiar, it's known, but who is in heaven? So majestic, sovereign, universe builder. We address God as dearest Father, but we do so with deepest wonder. 
This is how the prayer starts. A father who is close, with words that inspire affection and family, but in a location that is holy and otherworldly. And then what comes next are three different petitions. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Now the first petition, uh, hallowed be your name, another way of saying that would just be to say, may your name be made holy. Holy means set apart. The best modern word I think that we would understand would probably be reverence. So when you pray, hallowed be your name, what you're saying is, Father, may your name be revered on the earth, just like it's revered in heaven. Hallowed be your name says, may your name be given the reverence that is due your character and nature because you are the heavenly Father. So when you say the words, hallowed be your name, don't picture yourself <laughs> running into the throne room, out of breath, hoping just to rush through this long list of things you need to ask the king for just so that you can check it off your box and then just <laughs> run back out. Instead, you are coming into the presence. You are recognizing who God is. Even the Ten Commandments says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The book of Psalms says, So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. See, a reset in our prayer life would ask the question, is what I'm praying today, is it something that is for the glory of his name or mine? Am I building his kingdom or mine? When we pray, hallowed be thy name, we are saying, Father, I realize that it's your reputation that is at stake, not mine. So today, may I live in such a way to be a credit to you. May others see your character through my behavior. May others hear your words through my voice. May others see your actions through my deeds. I want to make your name great. Praying not only that his name be holy, but secondly, that his kingdom comes, right? For Jesus, the kingdom of God was the priority. Jesus taught the kingdom of God more than any other message. It was the secret message that he taught, weaved in through every single parable. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In John, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. In Luke, Jesus says, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. And even in the most popular sermon Jesus ever preached, in Mark chapter 1, he says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In fact, there's more than a hundred verses where Jesus refers to the kingdom of God in one way or another. It's not surprising then that Jesus teaches his followers that the order of business in your prayer, after you enter into the throne room, after you acknowledge God's fatherhood and otherness, is that you affirm the priority of establishing and building God's kingdom in the world. In fact, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, we understand that we are praying for an increasing appearance of the kingdom. Not just in the world, but in our lives. Jesus says in Luke, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. The Apostle Paul tells us that we have already been transferred over into the kingdom of God in the book of Colossians. He says he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, we are acknowledging that God has a right to rule all people, including us. In fact, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to pray, thy kingdom come, unless we fully intend to cooperate with God and to submit to God's will. Plus, 
when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, we are asking for the spread of the gospel, right? For anyone that does not know Christ, this, this is also an evangelistic prayer. You are praying for the kingdom of Christ to grow in the hearts and minds of people who yet do not know Christ. Plus, we're also praying for the return of Jesus, right? I mean, don't you get that same kind of sense in those words when you pray them that you understand? That, that's one of the things I think about too when I pray. When we pray, your kingdom come, we are asking for the second coming of Jesus to come to earth. Revelations 11 says the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So praying, not only your kingdom come, but thirdly, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the third and final petition that still all centers on God. Isn't it sad that millions of us have prayed this prayer at one time or another, your will be done, without the faintest idea of what God's will even is? Or meant it? Your will be done means that you are not asking God to change his will. You are not asking God to bless your will. You are asking God to help you find out what his will is. Think about what you're praying. We are asking that our own wills be thrown out if it means accomplishing God's will in our life. To pray, your will be done, means we understand that prayer is not about getting God on my side. We are trying to get on his side. And the second part of that petition is that it's going to happen on earth just like it happens in heaven. How do you think God's will happens in heaven? I mean, I know we've never been there, but what, what would you expect? What do you think? I mean, if you visited heaven, what do you think that you would see? Don't you think you would see unity? Harmony? Peace? Everyone working together? Everyone working for a common goal? There would be no incident? No one would have to be prompted to do the right thing? People would do it without complaining? The will of God done to the letter without fail. Now, we're halfway through this prayer, and you've probably noticed the same thing that I've noticed. Up until this point, the entire prayer is about God. It's not about us. It's about God. Now, why do you think that is? Because prayer is our connection to God. Prayer then becomes our connection to life. It's to the source of grace and love and the kingdom. So we need to be connected to the Father because being connected to him means that we are connected to the source of everything. And if we're going to reset this morning, if we're going to reset our prayer life, then we need to prioritize what takes place in our prayer. And as we're seeing, it should be God first, not us first. His kingdom, his glory, his knownness and his unknownness comes first. And I know we all know this prayer, right? We learned it in vacation Bible school, or we learned it in Sunday school, or our grandmother taught us to us, or our parents taught this to us. Uh, we could all say it with our eyes closed and one hand tied behind our back. But let's not blow through this prayer. Let's not just check it off like it's a task that needs to get done. Let's not just read these words and not understand what they mean. We pray to God, and so we are acknowledging him, and we are giving him all of the reverence that he deserves. And then we move on to the next part. Now, the next part does focus on us. It says, give us our daily bread. You know, when I read this passage, I don't know what it makes you think of, but it always makes me think of the Israelites. The Israelites wandering in the desert, eating the manna that appeared on the ground daily. God gave the Israelites just enough provisions daily for the day 
and nothing more because it kept them dependent on God. It made the relationship visual. He didn't give an abundance. He didn't give them a million dollars. He didn't help them win the lottery. He gave them just enough for the day. Matthew 6 says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The next section says, Forgive us our debts. Or we could say, Forgive us our sin, correct? How often do I need to be forgiven for my sin? Daily. So, how often should I pray? It says, as we have forgiven our debtors, or as we have forgiven those who sin against us. So apparently I don't just need to focus on the one who sins against me, but also I should focus on my sins against others. And then we close the prayer out with forgiveness. And we say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In other words, forgive me and keep me away from all of the things that need me to require forgiveness. And so as we close today, I just want to offer a couple of other ways that you can reset your prayer life. What works for me is praying out loud. I do it all the time. Talking out loud helps me stay focused when I pray. If I pray silently, if I pray in my head, then my mind wanders and pretty soon I'm thinking about laundry and cleaning more than I'm thinking about what I'm supposed to be praying for. Or you can keep a prayer journal. Write your prayers down. A lot of people prefer to write their prayers. For some people, this helps them uh, not only spark creativity, but it helps them feel a little closer to God. And it becomes a really great resource for you to go back and look at previous prayers to see how God answered them. And really, that's all the book of Psalms is. I mean, if you think about the book of Psalms, it's a little prayer journal. Prayer is you opening your soul to God. So your words don't have to be fancy, like Jesus said. They don't even have to be polished. Just write what comes from your heart. Pray what comes from your heart. Who knows? Maybe you'll write out a couple of prayers, and one of them, you think, or two or three, will be good enough that you'll want to share them from right up here and pray for all of us in the congregation. Last, I heard about a pastor who recommended praying for just a few minutes on the hour, every hour. Maybe as your day begins, you use the first hour to talk about how awesome God is and to praise him. Maybe as the hours go on, you start getting more towards confession, forgiveness, and the things that we request. I think that would probably help fulfill the passage, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, which says, pray without ceasing. In other words, we should always have our hearts and minds set on God. We should always be in constant communion with him. And then at the end, I would just say, we should pause to listen. It shouldn't just be us running into the throne room, asking for our requests, and then immediately running out the other way. We should pause a few minutes and let your heart be still. Listen to see if God wants to speak to you. That's important. If you've asked God a question or you've come seeking his guidance, we need to stop and listen for him to speak. Church, when Jesus gave us these words to pray, it wasn't so that we could rush through it and check it off lifelessly, just so that we could say that we did it. This prayer is filled with rich imagery. It's filled with intentional language. We should meditate our way through it. Maybe to give you something practical this morning, let's challenge ourselves. Let's say the Lord's Prayer every single day this week and really focus on these words. Can we do that this week? Let's pray the Lord's Prayer every single day until we come back again on Sunday and really focus on these words. Focus on the holiness, focus on the daily provisions, and focus on our daily need to be forgiven.
and to forgive others. Let's pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you are the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for taking this time out of your Sunday to come and listen. Of course, if you're listening to us on MP3, uh, on our podcast, or if you're watching us on YouTube, there's probably a link up there at the top. You can always clip and copy that, post it to your own Facebook wall, and let other people know uh, what you watched this morning, or share it with a friend. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you guys next week. Thanks. Bye.